Hello out there. This is White Ashflies with Colin Mahoney, and I'm coming to you on a sunny Friday afternoon here in the Willamette Valley. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've had a good week. Today, I'm reading a short essay by the novelist and critic Samuel Butler on Knowing What Gives Us Pleasure, written around 1880. Best known for his novels Erewhon and the autobiographical The Way of All Flesh, Butler also wrote prose translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey and advanced a theory that Homer was actually a Sicilian woman. Butler was also an evolutionist who wrote several books highly critical of Charles Darwin. Believing that Darwin's reputation as the father of the evolutionary theory was undeserved. You can find this and previous episodes of White Ash Flies on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Anchor FM, and Acast. And you can follow me on Twitter at Colin Mahoney15. And now, on Knowing What Gives Us Pleasure on White Ash Flies. 1. One can bring no greater reproach against a man than to say that he does not set sufficient value upon pleasure. And there is no greater sign of a fool than the thinking that he can tell at once and easily what it is that pleases him. To know this is not easy, and how to extend our knowledge of it is the highest and most neglected of all arts and branches of education. Indeed, if we could solve the difficulty of knowing what gives us pleasure, if we could find its springs, its inception, and earliest modus operandi, we should have discovered the secret of life and development, for the same difficulty has attended the development of every sense from touch onwards, and no new sense was ever developed without pains. A man had better stick to known and proved pleasures, but if he will venture in quest of new ones, he should not do so with a light heart. One reason why we find it so hard to know our own likings is because we are so little accustomed to try. We have our likings found for us in respect of by far the greater number of the matters that concern us. Thus we have grown all our limbs on the strength of the likings of our ancestors and adopt these without question. Another reason is that, except in mere matters of eating and drinking, people do not realize the importance of finding out what it is that gives them pleasure if, that is to say, they would make themselves as comfortable here as they reasonably can. Very few, however, seem to care greatly whether they are comfortable or no. There are some men so ignorant and careless of what gives them pleasure that they cannot be said ever to have been really born as living beings at all. They present some of the phenomena of having been born. They reproduce, in fact, so many of the ideas which we associate with having been born that it is hard not to think of them as living beings. But in spite of all appearances, the central idea is wanting. At least one half of the misery which meets us daily might be removed or, at any rate, greatly alleviated, if those who suffer by it would think it worth their while to be at any pains to get rid of it. That they do not so think is proof that they neither know, nor care to know, more than in a very languid way, what it is that will relieve them most effectually, or, in other words, that the shoe does not really pinch them so hard as we think it does, for when it really pinches, as when a man is being flogged, he will seek relief by any means in his power. So my great namesake said, Surely the pleasure is as great of being cheated as to cheat. And so again, I remember to have seen a poem many years ago in Punch, according to which a certain young lady, being discontented at home, went out into the world in quest to some burden make or burden bear, but which she did not greatly care. O oh, misery! 
So long as there was discomfort somewhere, it was all right. To those, however, who are desirous of knowing what gives them pleasure, but do not quite know how to set about it, I have no better advice to give than that they must take the same pains about acquiring this difficult art as about any other, and must acquire it in the same way. That is, by attending to one thing at a time, and not being in too great a hurry. Proficiency is not to be attained here, any more than elsewhere, by shortcuts or by getting other people to do work that no other than oneself can do. Above all things, it is necessary here, as in all other branches of study, not to think we know a thing before we do know it, to make sure of our ground and be quite certain that we really do like a thing before we say we do. When you cannot decide whether you like a thing or not, nothing is easier than to say so and to hang it up among the uncertainties. Or when you know you do not know, and are in such doubt as to see no chance of deciding, then you may take one side or the other provisionally, and throw yourself into it. This will sometimes make you uncomfortable, and you will feel you have taken the wrong side, and thus learn that the other was the right one. Sometimes you will feel you have done right, Anyway, ere long you will know more about it. But there must have been a secret treaty with yourself to the effect that the decision was provisional only. For, after all, the most important first principle in this matter is the not lightly thinking you know what you like till you have made sure of your ground. I was nearly forty before I felt how stupid it was to pretend to know things that I did not know and I still often catch myself doing so. Not one of my schoolmasters taught me this, but altogether otherwise. 2. I should like to like Schumann's music better than I do. I dare say I could make myself like it better if I tried, but I do not like having to try to make myself like things. I like things that make me like them at once, and no trying at all. 3. To know whether you are enjoying a piece of music or not, you must see whether you find yourself looking at the advertisements of Pear Soap at the end of the program. 